Praise the Lord and greetings. Right now I would like to do this topic on 1 Timothy chapter 5 and touch on the question, did Paul teach for celibacy? And in this chapter, in this section, we have to use an inductive reasoning. We have to infer things. And we have to take Paul for what he said elsewhere and use that as a foundation. In 1 Corinthians 7, the purpose for the chapter is to remain as he was, and that is single. Other things are taught in the chapter, but that is the purpose of the chapter at the greatest whole. But we see in the chapter that he was not against marriage. And, you know, we see this, of course, in Romans 7. That a widow is allowed to marry. And someone who has been single from their youth up. Okay. So when you get into 1 Timothy 5, you have some sayings that are interesting. Okay. And I have what I find to believe as the only way to harmonize 1 Timothy 5, the other things that Paul said concerning this. And I'd like to share that now. In 1 Timothy 5, we read at verse 3, 4, 5, speaking about a widow. And some different ways in which a widow would be taken care of. Okay. And the piety at home and to requite their parents and the honor widows that are widows indeed. Verse 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. A good text to support spiritual death. Of course, the woman is alive in the flesh, but dead in the spirit. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. So now as we go forward, what we see is a charge. What we see is one of the lesser spoken of ordinances in the church. Okay, this is not one that gets spoke of a lot. We, of course, speak about... Baptisms, okay, head coverings, even laying out of hands probably gets spoke of more. This is another one in this chapter, and it's, to me, one of those things that cannot be avoided that Paul taught this, and how else can you make sense of what he said unless if there is a church ordinance around it and what I'll get into now shortly that goes along with it. Starting back at verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. Okay, so now there's this certain widow that is 60 years or older. Okay, and now this widow is looked at as potential for something taken into the number. I'll get to the second half of verse 9 again shortly. Verse 10, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have received the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanted against Christ, they will marry. So now this older widow is now in a state of celibacy. Just by taking the deduction here from verse 11. Now, this particular widow is taken into the number having been the wife of one man. 
Now, a woman could have gotten remarried, been part of, which is unlikely, but you never know. Certain women could have had, you know, more than one husband at a time, okay? It's not anything exactly to read of, but, you know, she could have been into diverse sexual sins. She's not to be taken into this number. It's not as if you can't repent of those things and be saved. But the purpose of this number is to remain celibate, okay? And what you are as something we can look back on is someone like Anna, okay? That you're going to serve God night and day in prayers, Okay, and that's what you're going to do. So you're actually going to take a vow for celibacy. Okay. That's how to harmonize what Paul is saying here. Because the younger widows, he says to refuse. And in verse 12, it says, having damnation because they cast off their first faith. So when he says, you know, they will marry, how can you have damnation just by getting married. Because we know Paul said it's okay to get married. Well, it's because if they were taken into this number and they took that vow of celibacy and then they were to marry, they were to break their vow. And then they would have damnation. So that's why Paul, when he's looking at someone prospectively for this in the church. He's looking at an older woman, okay? An older woman, a lot less likely to be tempted to get married if she wants to come into this prayer and supplication. And even an older woman that wasn't given to sexual sin in her past. At least by nothing less than remarriage, okay? That she didn't have multiple husbands and things like this. This is what Paul's saying. So at least those sexual sins. Okay. But younger widows don't even take them in because it will give the devil a place against them. It's not worth it. Okay. They're more protected outside of this. This is not for them in this ordinance. Okay. And that's why it says in verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So this is not Paul now encouraging marriage because he obviously was not necessarily discouraging it in 1 Corinthians 7, but he was not pushing it. Okay. He was encouraging for those to be like him. Okay. And the father over the virgin, he does, you know, well to keep his virgin and things like this. And better even, okay? So, this is why I see that a vow has to be looked and understood and read out of his teaching here, okay? Or else you can't really harmonize 1 Corinthians 7 to 1 Timothy 5. And that would make sense with the flow of what he's saying and having damnation just by getting married, which we know is not over every situation. But in this particular a widow coming into this number who would be given to prayer and supplication day and night, serving God, that there would be a vow of celibacy. Okay? And that's the thing about vows. In our day and age, there's very few people that even understand vows, whether it's through, 
you know, transgression against moral law. They won't keep their vows, okay? And then there's a multitude of people that can't teach about vows because they don't even understand what they are or they believe that Jesus gave brand new sets of teachings concerning oaths and things like this. And it's just not something that makes any sense. I mean, marriage is still marriage. Marriage is still a covenant. It's not going away. Jesus did not come to change what marriage was. And he didn't come to take away marriage because he took away quote-unquote oaths. I mean, it's just not anything he did. It's just not understood by those reading. And there's the false teachers that do not understand covenants. Okay? You're allowed to take a vow before God, okay, by God, as long as it's not sinful, okay? It's not anything we necessarily encourage anyone to do. I mean, if we're not even to encourage a marriage, then why would we now somehow encourage people to take other vows, okay? And this is how Paul teaches in this chapter, but he does say this is a possibility that if a woman who is a widow did want this, she can, okay? Just like if you want to get married, you can, okay? And these things. And then once that vow is taken, you cannot marry then. So if you are a bishop and you're in this situation where you have to exercise oversight on these matters and you have widows around you that, you know, would like to seek God and see what God has for them as touching this, then this is one possibility. The younger woman in the chapter is referring to a younger widow. That's the flow of the passage. And those women are not to be taken into this. When it comes to women that have been put away by men, they're not widows. So there's no point in thinking of it like that. It's not that you don't help women like that. But the point is, is that the man's supposed to get back involved. And what happens to women that are put away by men, you're going to see in cases is they don't want the man back. So now they've also rejected their vows. So there's no point in the church to help this rejection of their vows along. You do not want to help this type of mentality along because it's of the devil. And as soon as God's name is used and a vow is not kept okay, then what's the point? What strength is in his name? Okay, and this is fundamental basics. So you have to hold people to these things. Whatever is in line with the moral law, we must hold people to them. Okay, you know, and there's, you know, a vow taken. We must hold people to these things because they have to take God's name with purity and they cannot take it in vain and they cannot be covenant breakers in these things. So we will continue to do this because we have full liberty to do this and we have all the reasons why. Okay. I mean, Paul says having damnation because they cast off their first faith for getting married. Okay. So we understand that there is a severity in this number and things like this. So, you know, different things could be mentioned of why this is added, you know, in the New Testament time, okay, to the apostolic teaching and then the charge given thereto. We do have Anna in the Old Testament, so we see that the Holy Spirit was using a woman as a prophetess who was in the temple and she was serving God in this way. So we already see that God was using something like this, okay? And that we have this now from the Apostle Paul. So at this point, you know, I want to end this teaching with that. And, you know, this teaching probably 
serves more in more specific cases, okay? But it is a fascinating teaching that Paul gave, and I feel like this is the correct way to harmonize it. In Jesus' name, bless God.